Hello, welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shell, and I'm joined by Sam Spieler and Ied Darris. Sam oh, first, yeah. as usual. Yes. <laughs> Shit. As it should be. Oh, man. All right. Yeah, this is going to be a good episode where Sam's first. Today, we are wrapping up our discussion of Paradise by Toni Morrison. This is the first book in our series of contemporary utopias. If you're listening to us for the first time, we are also on Reddit. You can join our discussion there by clicking on the link in the episode description. If you'd like to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link. That's also in the episode description. At that page, you can find books for our book club and other books that we recommend. You can find us on social media at CanonicalPod. Next week, we will continue our series with a review of Kiran Yaga by Mike Resnick, the next book in our Contemporary Utopias series. We hope you'll join us for that episode as well. So, Ed, you wanted to talk about something nice and happy. <laughs> That's me, Mr. Happy. Maybe you guys have heard of postmodernism, or maybe you have heard of now what they're calling cultural Marxism. These are these kind of buzzwords that you'll hear if you watch too much Fox News. And these are the kind of things that people who don't really understand the social sciences like to talk about when they want very much to talk about the social sciences and the humanities. Wait, postmodernism is just now getting onto Fox News? Well, this is kind of a genealogy. So first it was postmodernism that they didn't understand but wanted to talk about. And then it was cultural Marxism. And then our topic du jour, critical race theory. And I think if you spend any amount of time paying attention to what the right is saying particularly, you'll probably have heard about critical race theory recently. I think most of the people talking about it don't really know what it is. So I think it's worth talking about in light of this novel because I think that when you start to understand what it is, I think you can find a very direct way that it is manifest in this novel. I think it's quite clear, in fact. But first of all, I think we'd better try to figure out what it is. And specifically, I guess we can think of how it might be different from a view of race that we might call the civil rights view of race. The way I think of it is this. Critical race theory is a theoretical perspective that could be thought of as an answer to what you might hear from a lot of people. They say things like, oh, racism is over. Racism doesn't exist anymore. And I think the reason why people will say things like that is, number one, because they're very poorly informed. But number two, I think the reason why they say this is because in their life, they don't know people who use racial slurs and they don't have any experience of racial violence. But I think even more so, they think that race isn't problematic because of the political power that has been wielded by biracial people like Kamala Harris or Barack Obama. So from one point of view, when you look at American society especially, you could say, oh, racism doesn't exist. But I think the CRT perspective argues that race, in fact, continues to be an issue despite this access to political power and despite this apparent absence of racial violence, because the knock-on effects of racist thought have, in fact, embedded themselves in the conceptual framework that we use to deal with law, social integration, and a host of other aspects of society that are laden with power. So it's a much more insidious form of racial or racist thought that is more difficult to pinpoint. And because it's more difficult to pinpoint, it's more difficult to deal with. In the analysis of this novel, Paradise, that I read by Richard Schur, he offers a very clear example of critical race theory in action. This is the 1996 U.S. Supreme Court ruling on U.S. versus Armstrong. And 
In that case, Armstrong argued that the FBI's drug stings were targeting people of color specifically and their neighborhoods specifically. But the court decision said that this was not the case because there was a requirement for proof of discriminatory effect that needed to be motivated by discriminatory purpose. That means that similar people of other races were not punished, but people who were people of color were punished for identical actions. But I think the critical race theory perspective here is that this decision only considered individual behaviors and individual data as a counterexample. And because of this, it had excluded all of the other sociological data available about groups and their motives and behaviors from the conversation. Well, for example, I think that article talks about how white people were, first of all, let off easier but they were also different drugs. They weren't being charged for crack. They were being charged for powder. The evidence in favor of this would be what I think opponents of critical race theory would say are just anecdotal, or it's just a storytelling way of thinking about justice where we are not comparing like with like, but we are comparing anecdotes that are offered after the fact. But the critical race perspective, I think, would say that you have to broaden your conceptual framework for thinking and talking about race and its impact in America in a way that makes a lot of other people uncomfortable. So I guess given that example of where we see critical race theory in contemporary America, do we see this in the novel? One of the ways I see it at play in this novel is that white people are almost completely absent from it, and yet their presence kind of sits like this shadow over everything. We get this condemnation of white racist politics in the form of, for example, the all-black communities and the shunning of light-skinned Black people from the town of Ruby as kind of this over-the-top rejection of white politics. And yet, they are doing the exact thing that has been done to them. They've internalized the white law of the land so much so that they are kind of perverting their own version of it in Ruby. They can't really escape it. I think the tension in the novel is a tension between this kind of civil rights view of race and the critical race theory view of race. There is a tension between the two that seems to invite a trade-off. The townspeople in Ruby seem to place the same emphasis on political power and equality that I think motivates civil rights era thinking on race. That if we have our own place and we have our own communities and we can be separate and independent socially, politically, economically, we can protect ourselves. And that is true enough to an extent, but what I think the novel shows us is that that type of isolationist thinking has its own consequences as well. Well, it gives them political protection from white lawmakers, and it gives them social protection from light-skinned black people in the other towns by isolating themselves. It's a reification of the colorism as a source of political and social power that existed elsewhere. So their actions are just reiterating the same prejudices that they've been suffering from beginning. Well, not only that, by doing so, they're not allowing themselves to move forward. The world on the outside does start changing. For example, there does seem to be more of an acceptance toward the end of the book in terms of things like health care. But because the town of Ruby refuses to move forward, they don't get the benefits of those changes. 
So it's kind of like a, an emphasis on protecting certain things prevents you from seeing what else you could be standing to gain. So uh, to clarify, what proponents of critical race theory want is to address the systemic inequalities present in our system, right? I would say yes, but I think the way that they view systemic inequality and the way that they get access to it is difficult for others to accept because they are more interested in the self-reported, the intersubjective, the anecdotal, and they take that seriously. Whereas I think traditional law has considered individuals as acting on their own with their own individual motivations that couldn't be determined after the fact. So I wonder if this act of creating Ruby, of creating their own community that is separate from the community at large, this redefinition of the world they want to live in, could that be viewed as something as radical as creating a new structure for society, this utopian structure that would enable them to remove inequality? Like, is this an attempt to remove the systemic inequality that is present in American society? Yes, I would say so. But I think what troubles it is that it's motivated by a desire to remove inequality, but because of their limited way of thinking, their approach to eliminating inequality just reiterates it. Can you explain that a little bit more? No, not for me, because I'm smart, but for the audience who is dumb. Well, I think ultimately what Morrison shows us in this novel is that segregation on a surface level that achieves political power or segregation that achieves economic power is just one part of true justice. But true justice that I think Morrison has in mind involves what a lot of scholars would call decolonization, where our ways of thinking and understanding have to be taken out of these racist frameworks that rely on things like colorism as a source of legitimate power. Because by saying this is a place for dark-skinned Black people only, they are also still saying that the color of your skin matters and that it's legitimate for people with darker skin to be treated differently from people with lighter skin. I think in another sense, what you could say is that these people and their way of thinking is very reactionary. It's not very effective, but it's natural that they would react this way, I suppose, in the face of racial violence and inequality perpetrated against them by white America at that time. So I don't know if it's necessarily a wholesale condemnation of their ideology, but it's just an exploration of the insufficiency of their ideology. Well, and it reiterates the separate but equal both in attempting to structure it as separate but equal, but it also reaches the same problematic conclusions of the separate but equal doctrine that isn't actually equal. So this is a little bit complicated, though, the separate but equal, because I think, as I understand it, part of the, the thinking here is that you cannot really have equality of opportunity Right? Because for people who suffer from systemic discrimination, there is no equality of opportunity. Right. I think that's what motivates them to isolate themselves, because they cannot get equality of opportunity. Outside of Ruby, they are loath to do anything outside of their town, because their town allows them control over all of the systems that provide opportunity to them. Do you think there is equality of opportunity if such a thing exists in Ruby? I think it exists in the case that the, the brothers can own a bank and get rich off of owning a bank and owning property. 
This is an opportunity that they would not have had elsewhere, but I think it's an opportunity that comes at a very real consequence to other aspects of their life. Here I'm thinking the big irony that I see in the novel is the way that this kind of emphasis on insecurity and being worried about being denied access to the things that they want by white America prompts them to look at the outside world with disdain, and particularly the way they look at the women in the convent. People who are actually truly without power, who are actually downtrodden, but they see them as a threat, even though these people who are actually only beneficial to them. Because they see these women as a threat, their attempts to eliminate them actually ends up creating an actual threat through the potential presence of white law in Ruby after they murder these women. So I'm hung up on how this idea intersects with the idea of utopia. Because for me, what's interesting, and you can tell me if I'm off base here, is that if you subscribe to critical race theory, you have to kind of subscribe to the idea that because of systemic racism, a lot of the issues cannot be fixed in America. So you create a utopia outside of America or an exclave in America that allows you to create this structure that frees you from this systemic racism. Does that understanding make sense? I think where I differ from you is you're saying it is impossible to achieve this kind of this kind of access that you want. And I think that the perspective of critical race theory is that it is possible, but it is immensely more complicated than civil rights thinking would lead you to believe. I think civil rights thinking would lead you to believe that political power, land ownership, economic power, these are the keys for the elimination of the problem of race in America and a move towards a utopian society. And I think what critical race theory has to say is that racism has it embedded itself into the ways of understanding the world that all Americans share to such an extent that before actual utopian societies can emerge, we have to decolonize our minds and change the conceptual way of understanding our society. So where I was going with this actually is, do you think the convent is such a utopia? I think the convent is an attempt at that. I think Morrison sets it up as an actual paradise where Ruby is supposed to be a paradise, but isn't. She sets it up as this kind of what we were talking about before with pairing two opposites at odds with each other. We have the freedom of the convent, which has gone through different states in its own history, versus Ruby stuck in its need for the status quo. The Morgan brothers are so focused on power and structure and status quo, they don't want anything to change. If it falls outside of their view of what their utopia looks like, then it's not correct and it has to be snuffed out. Whereas the convent is able to exist on its own without the rigidity, I guess, of the outside world. And that is why it's a threat to Ruby, because it exists without these rules that Ruby seems to require. Yeah, I agree. I think that the novel presents Ruby as a place of very intense ideological fixity. They want to keep the motto on the oven the same. They're kind of tormenting young people like Menace who want to marry people with light skin from outside of the town. In kind of stark contrast to that, we have the convent, which to me is a site of radical openness. Because in the beginning of the novel, it struck me as quite odd that these people could just show up there. And if they needed a place to stay, they could stay. If they needed food to eat, they could eat. It was a very nurturing place, almost unrealistically so, but they were very open to outsiders. Even people from the town. Right, yeah. You bring up Menace. He goes there 
to help with his alcoholism. And their way of working through trauma is also much more open and much more, the word I had used previously in our discussion was authentic. I'm thinking of Connie's loud dreaming practice where she has them lie on the ground and draw outlines of their bodies and they do a lot of chanting and dancing. It seems more motivated by an authentic human experience rather than this kind of fixity towards the foundational myth that the town of Ruby has. And to me, I see this as not only an affinity between this openness of behavior, but also a causal relationship between this openness of behavior and then the kind of conceptual openness that I think the critical race theory perspective requires. Because you have to have the freedom to behave as you wish in order to have the freedom in turn then to think as you wish. And I think that that's kind of the beginnings of this decolonizing process that a lot of the CRT people have in mind. So I think now we can all kind of see how critical race theory might be in this novel, but for me, it kind of feels a bit one-sided in general. When you have a novelist who problematizes a situation, it feels literary. It feels like an exploration of a complex idea and offering a straightforward solution or offering one side that is totally correct and one side that is not correct feels reductive. But in this novel, I can't help but feel that the people of Ruby have taken the completely wrong approach to the issue of race. And by extension, the people of the convent seem to have a much superior approach. But do you think that Morrison is offering such a simple conclusion? Is this kind of eight rock social ideology that they have in Ruby actually more compelling than I give it credit for? Uh... I don't know if it's more compelling, but I don't think we can completely condemn it all by itself. I think we have to understand that it was the right choice given its time, but that it needed to give way to change. The biggest problem with Ruby is that it didn't allow itself to change. They survived by creating this sanctuary for themselves. But where they went wrong was stamping out a true sanctuary when it appeared next to them. I don't think you're wrong. I don't think there is much more going on in Ruby. I think Meisner complicates that a little bit because we see him at the end as attempting to be the link between a more accepting version of Christianity a more lenient and yielding version, someone who is willing to stay behind in what is obviously a failing town in order to help save it. But I don't think you are wrong. At its core, it's just a flawed idea. I think that the author of the article I mentioned earlier, Richard Shore, will probably agree with your summation that the ideology of Ruby has its moment. I think he's a bit more positive than I am because he considers their ideology as part of a historical moment that is passed through on a journey towards justice. But it's a journey towards justice that is constantly being displaced by trauma. He says that in each chapter, the trajectory towards justice is always displaced by a narrative of some trauma suffered by a new woman or a new trauma explained in the context of the novel. And the ongoing presence of these traumas and this kind of injustice is a continual reminder for people that we are more insecure than we would like to be, and we have fewer protections economically, legally, socially than we want to have. So it's kind of like the way memory haunts us, because whenever we feel like we can move on towards a different way of understanding race, we're always reminded that people can be gunned down for jogging, or people can be gunned down for 
walking through the wrong neighborhood or talking back to a police officer. That kind of insecurity undermines the progress that we might have towards the more complicated ways of dealing with race that critical race theory might offer. If we think of it then, though, as a kind of a reset button, these acts of trauma, it kind of offers a progression, you might say, a progression from civil rights thinking to critical race thinking that I'm not sure I can agree with. Is it ideally this case that one will replace the other, or do both need to exist side by side? Does critical race theory supplant civil rights theory, or is it filling in the gaps and showing... It's an augmentation. Right. To me, it feels like something we are building on top of. Well, that's the way it feels in broader society. But within the context of the novel, it's not named as such, but it does feel like the the way of thinking offered, which I think is very broadly civil rights thinking offered by the people of Ruby, is insufficient. And I'm not sure if in the novel, Morrison is saying we need both or not. Because I know how I feel about real life, but I'm trying to figure out what Morrison has to say in the novel. Yeah, I, I'm unwilling to fully go that far. If I follow this line of thinking, the assumption is that Morrison is saying that civil rights theory cannot abide by critical race theory, that it can't allow it to exist simultaneously. In real life, I think we could probably all agree that civil rights thinking has made a lot of progress in the lives of real people. But I think if we carry it to its extreme, it becomes more complicated. Like if we try to consider the idea of an all-black town. Do all-black towns existing in modern America stand as a move towards social justice or a move away from social justice? Logically, an all-black town feels like a move away from social justice, but I have trouble connecting that to what's happening in Paradise because Paradise feels not outlandish per se, but as you put it, an argument drawn out to a very long conclusion. It's not that it's unrealistic. It's just it feels it feels so drawn out. It, it feels like such a straw man, I guess. Um, I don't know if I'm saying what you're saying, but I think what I would say is that this book does not directly take on this idea of critical race theory. I think that this idea of a utopian all-black town is a rejection of civil rights theory, because if civil rights worked, you wouldn't need an all-black town, because everyone would be equal and no one would be persecuted. So the mere existence of this is a condemnation of civil rights and how it's failed to protect everybody. Not to say that it hasn't done anything, but to say that it hasn't done enough. So for me, the existence of an all-black town, the need for it, is saying that civil rights is not enough. But I think part of the issue here, if we're trying to apply these ideas to this book, is that it is not very explicitly present. And of course, not all ideas have to be. So it's not that this reading is invalid, but it's more like that you have to draw certain connections here that maybe we should not be drawing because there isn't enough evidence. But to make the reading work, we have to take certain leaps. One of the issues that I have with Paradise is If I view it under the lens of critical race theory, I kind of understand the various condemnations that are happening. But because it, as you put it, James, doesn't tackle it head on, it leaves me with some questions. For example, I 
wonder if this is a condemnation of how racism pervades every aspect of the U.S., even where white people are more or less absent, or is it a condemnation of the black community in regard to prejudices about color and sex, even after all the hardships? Well, I think it's both. I think so, too. And I think that's what critical race theory tells us. But does one of those stand out stronger than the other? Because I think, depending on your reading, one might stand out stronger than the other. There's also, I think, a condemnation of religious dogma. I know from critical race theory that that's also part of it, yes. But it's hard for me to connect the dots without knowing the term critical race theory. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you need to connect all of the dots because you could say the critical race theory interpretation that we've been exploring is one way of reading the novel, and it does conflict with other potential readings, but the readings don't need to exist side by side. They exist as alternatives. Like, if you just find that there isn't enough evidence to support the application of critical race theory to this novel, I wouldn't disagree with you, because I think that that's a perspective that you can take because you might just require more textual evidence than I do. I think it's worth investigating, not because there is a lot of textual evidence, but because it's interacting with the novel in the way that I think novels are most interesting to interact with. Like, this is why I read literature, is for discussions like this. So even if I don't know for sure that it can work out 100% well, I'm willing to go along with it because I think it's interesting and important to talk about. I guess my issue isn't so much that there isn't enough evidence, but that there are so many things going on at once that it is hard for me to lay out everything and make sense of it without outside reading. Well, I think that that's actually a point in favor of critical race theory, because critical race theory is quite invested in the idea of intersectionality and the idea that Mm. individual aspects of social phenomena can't be extracted and abstracted and analyzed individually, but they all exist in a web of different forces that interact with each other. So I think that if you're saying that you can't take this one part of it out and analyze it separately, that's just more proof to my mind that it is critical race theory in the text. All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So we've been talking about this text through the lens of critical race theory. Do you think that this book can possibly change the opinions of CRT skeptics? I don't think so. I think if critical race theory confuses skeptics, I don't think this book will offer them anything more clarifying. I expressed before the break that already there were things that confused me, and I'm on board with it. Yeah, I agree. The problem here is that this book itself is very complex, and critical race theory is very complex. So you need to draw a line between these two very complex ideas in order for the receptive skeptical audience to be more receptive to critical race theory. There are a lot of steps in between that needs to be drawn out. Like this would have to be taught in a class. You can't just present it and then magically at the end of reading this book, the skeptic will realize, oh, everything has been unfair all along. 
Right. I think there are too many possible readings that you can take that are not necessarily wrong, but incomplete. For example, I mentioned that the idea of the condemnation of the Black community, even in the face of hardship, when they still put down other people like the women at the convent, that's not wrong, but it's not complete either. It's missing a lot of other things that, for example, critical race theory would bring and fill in. And the true simpleton who reads this book will just leave the book thinking, oh, these black people are killing a lot of women. <laughs> They're messed up. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you really don't think about it, that's what you leave the book thinking. I think, yes, it's possible that there is a true simpleton out there who would have that. But I think in order to be intellectually fair to the people who oppose me, because I also believe in critical race theory, I think we have to take them seriously as thinking people. Now, at the beginning of the episode, I was kind of poking a little bit of fun, but you know, there are probably some people out there who are just opposed to it because it's kind of a dog whistle. And, oh, this is the thing I hate today, so I'm going to say I hate it. But I think there is a thinking person's opposition. And I think the opposition to critical race theory is basically that it deals more with stories than data. And it's much more concerned with treating people as a confluence of social factors rather than people as rational actors deciding what to do in their own interests. And in that sense, it's kind of contrary to the idea of liberalism that's so important to our society. So I can see all of those oppositional viewpoints, and I think that to some extent it's valid but I think what the novel shows is that there is so much of human experience that is important to people that we can't just throw away, even though it's very difficult to take anything out of it and abstract it and say, this happened because of this reason. I think what it really offers us is a way of understanding human behavior in a historically minded way that is difficult to come across outside of this novel. To understand human behavior and the way that it's motivated by the past is a very difficult thing to do if you're only watching cable news. And I think what this novel can do, which is really important, and what Morrison's work in general does, is it shows you how we are historically and socially determined. And not every CRT opponent will be able to clue in on that, but I think some will, or I hope some will. I think you're giving them a lot of credit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll stop here. Thank you for listening. If you thought we were off base here with our reading of this book, you can let us know on Reddit. That link is below. We are also on social media at Canonical Pod. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, you can give us a review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. Next week, we will start our next book, Kiran Yaga by Mike Resnick. We hope you'll join us for that one. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.